Recently, while going through an airport during one of his many trips, former President George W. Bush encountered a man with long hair. He was wearing a white robe. He had sandals on and he was holding a staff. So President Bush went up to the man and asked him, aren't you Moses? But the man wouldn't answer. He just kept staring ahead. Again, the president said, Moses. The man just kept staring ahead, never answering the president. Well, soon a Secret Service agent came along and President Bush grabbed him and said, doesn't that man look like Moses to you? Well, the Secret Service agent, of course, is going to agree with the president. Well, said the president, every time I say his name, he just keeps staring ahead and refuses to speak. Watch. And again, President Bush yelled, Moses. And again, the men just kept staring forward. Well, the Secret Service agent went up to the man in the white robe and he, and he whispered, he said, you look just like Moses. Are you Moses? And the man leaned over and whispered, yes, I am Moses. But the last time I talked to a bush, I spent 40 years wandering in the desert. <laughs> you know, we've been in a series called Out of the Shadows, and we have been traveling uh, with Moses and the ancient Israelites who have spent the past 400 years living as slaves in Egypt. But now, under the leadership of Moses, they exit Egypt on a journey to the land that God had promised to give them. So far, we have learned that the time Israel spent in Egypt as slaves is a shadow of the bondage and slavery to sin that we are all born into. We also learn that the blood of the sacrificed lamb that was applied to the doorframe of each Israeli home is a shadow of the blood of Jesus that redeems us from our bondage to sin. And last week, we saw how the crossing of the Red Sea is a shadow of Christian baptism. In today's message, we're going to delve into the story as the Israelites journey from the Red Sea. We'll investigate the period of time from when they came out of the Red Sea until they crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. From the eastern shore of the Red Sea, the Israelites travel to the base of Mount Sinai, where God delivers to them His laws and commands for the people. They stayed in camp at Mount Sinai for approximately a year after they left Egypt. Now it is time, though, to move out toward the land of Canaan. It is now time for God to fulfill the promise to the people of Israel that he had made. These people who had experienced terrible hardships as slaves in Egypt for the past 400 years years. I want you to see this map of the route of the Exodus. Now, on a direct route, the journey from Mount Sinai to the Promised Land would be about 175 miles. Now, an average person could walk, I don't know, 20 miles a day. So this trip would take about a week and a half. But we have to consider that the nation of Israel numbered around 2 million people or so. And they were lugging a fair amount of supplies along with livestock. So realistically, the trip from Mount Sinai to Canaan should have taken a month, month and a half. And how much time did it actually take for the Israelites to travel the 175 miles? Not a month or a month and a half, but 40 years. 40 years. Numbers chapter 32, verse 13, kind of explains to us what happened. And the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight were gone. So why did God's anger burn against them? What did they do to cause this journey to take 40 years instead of a month and a half? Well, this time period that we're going to look at today is known as the wandering in the wilderness. Now, the word wandering I uh, kind of defined is the time between where I start and where I want to end up. 
Right? That's kind of the wandering, where I start to where I want to end up. And you know what? God does a lot of his work in us while we are in the wandering, while we are in that time from where we started to where we hope to end up. But perhaps though we shouldn't look at this so much as a wandering, but as a journey. See, wandering has the connotation of doing something with really no purpose or no end in sight, which is likely how many of the Israelites felt as they wandered in the desert. But the word journey resonates with purpose and direction. And even though the people may have felt they were wandering, God actually had them on a journey. Now, in this series, we have seen how the Old Testament is filled with shadows of New Testament truths. And today, I want us to see how this 40 years of wandering in the wilderness is also a shadow. It is a shadow of the journey each of us are on as we walk with Jesus to our promised land. You see, we have applied the blood of the Lamb, we have walked through the waters of baptism, and now we are journeying what can be described as our promised land, heaven. Now, my journey began 43 years ago. Yours may be less, it may be more. Some of you are closer to the beginning while others are closer to completion. Yet we're all on this journey from where we started, our baptism, to where we want to arrive, heaven. And the trip that the Israelites took and the things that they experienced during those 40 years wandering in the desert can serve as a shadow of the experiences we will have walking with Christ. Now, on this journey, the Israelites faced both physical and spiritual challenges. I mean, living and existing in a desert had to be physically challenging. I mean, setting up camps and traveling in the heat, and there'd be sand everywhere and bugs and other desert animals, and, and then there'd be these other people groups that were threatened by these nomadic Jews wandering in the desert, and so they, they, they had a, a challenges. And, and so I, I want to try to, in this message, really we're going to attempt to cover the full 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness, but, but I didn't want to keep you here until about 3.30 this afternoon. So I, I tried to find a verse that could kind of summarize for us the overall experience that the, that the Hebrew people had as they wandered in the wilderness. And I think Exodus 15, verses 20 through to 27, uh, kind of summarize it for us. Let's read it. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved out into the desert of Shur. They traveled in the, de in the desert for three days without finding any water. When they came to the oasis of Marah, the water was too bitter to drink, so they called this place Marah, which means bitter. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink, they demanded. And Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. It was there at Marah that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and if you do what is right in his sight, if you obey his commands and you keep all of his decree, decrees, then I will make you, I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And so after leaving Marah, the Israelites traveled on to the oasis of Elam, where they found 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped beside the water. Now, this is kind of a kind of a summary. It, it, it's kind of cyclical here. You, you'll see, like first Moses is leading them, right? And then the people follow. But then the people become dissatisfied with what God is providing. So then they start complaining and grumbling. And then Moses doesn't know what to do with all these people, so he just cries out to God. God provides. But then God reminds them of the great promise he has made to them. 
that if they would follow his decrees and they would keep his commands, they would not suffer any of the diseases that God sent to the Egyptians. And then amazingly after that, he leads them to a place where there are 12 springs and 70 palm trees. But then I guess the cycle would begin again with the complaining. And so this is a really good summary of the 40-year journey from the Red Sea to the Promised Land. Now, on this journey, there are a number of battles that the people might, must fight. But, but today, I don't want to look at the military battles that they're fighting. I want to today look at the attitude battles they fought. I mean, every day, the people had to fight their natural leanings toward bad attitudes. And, and these attitude battles are not all that different than the attitude battles you and I have to face as we walk with Christ toward our promised land. So this morning, I want to look at, look, look at a few of these attitudes they battled and how we battle with it. And then at the end of the message, I want to make a very important point that I hope you'll take home with you. And so the first battle I want to look at right now is the battle that we fight, they fight, is the battle to be content. Now, ever since departing Egypt, these people had witnessed the mighty hand of God in ways that no one before or no one after ever really witnessed. Now they're safely on the other side of the river, and they are free for the first time in their lives. And the people just need to continue to trust God and his leading. And everything's going to be great, and the land's going to be delivered to them. But that is not what they do. You see, throughout the chapters in Exodus that cover this time in the desert, we read often verses like this one, now the people complained about their hardships. The people complained about their hardships. And that, and that pops up multiple times in this story. And one of the definitive marks of Israel's history is their persistent grumbling and complaining. They complained about their living conditions. They complained about the food they were given. They complained about the leadership of Moses. And what does their complaining reveal? It demonstrates that they were not really satisfied with God and what God was providing for them on this journey. Whether they were complaining about circumstances or complaining about food or complaining about Moses and Aaron, they were really complaining about God. You see, when we grumble and we complain, we're really saying, God, you're not being fair with me. You're not giving me what I believe I deserve. There's not enough water. It doesn't taste good. We don't like the food. We don't like the leadership. I mean, they were barely out of Egypt, and already they were missing the good old days. And isn't it odd how time and distance and and a lack of comfort can make us forget what the good old days were really like. Oh, they had plenty of water back in Egypt, but they were slaves. Sure, the pots of meat were plentiful, but they were slaves. And they didn't have Moses and Aaron calling the shots, but they were slaves. They certainly weren't calling the shots. How is it that they forget so quickly? But are you ever like the Israelites? I know I am. I mean, isn't it amazing when you think about how blessed we are in, in, in this country, in this time, and in this day, yet the things that we sometimes complain about? Are we having to wear a mask? Or the car we drive or the house we live in isn't as nice as others? <laughs> you know, because of the financial situation, we couldn't take a vacation this year. Oh, that music at church is just so loud. <laughs> a weak cell phone signal. Oh, what am I going to do? I can't stay connected. You know, our flight is delayed an hour and a half, even though you're going to get cross country in like five hours. You know, every morning, God would miraculously provide all that they would need for that day. But the people didn't live like God was providing. They began to crave other food, and they started hearkening back to the good old days, and they said, you know, if only we had meat to eat. 
I mean, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onion and the garlic. And we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Yet they forget that when they were in Egypt, they were slaves. They weren't free people. And they may not realize it. And you and I may not realize it. But what we're really saying is, look, God, we don't care what you have done for us up to this point. We don't care how much you have provided or how compassionate you have been. We don't care what miracles you have performed. The bottom line is on this day, today, right now, this isn't good enough for me. It's not what I want. You need to up your game, God. You need to do better. It's really what we're doing when we're complaining. I heard about a woman who was married to a chronic complainer. I mean, nothing she ever did was good enough. Well, she made on New Year's Day, she makes this resolution that she's going she's to be the perfect wife and she's going to please him the whole year. So on New Year's Day, she, she says to him, honey, I want, I want you to lie in bed and I'm going to fix you breakfast in bed. What would you like? So her husband said, well, two eggs, one scrambled and one sunny side up, bacon with toast, grits, coffee, and juice. She said, coming right up, you just stay right in bed. So she goes down and she fixes the perfect breakfast. I mean, the eggs were, were fluffy. The, the, the one egg that was sunny side up was perfect. And the bacon was crisp and the grits and toast were smothered in butter. And she put it all on a tray and she brought it to her husband there in bed. He looked at it and he snarled. Wouldn't you know it? You scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> you know, there is always going to be something you can find that you can complain about. Because nothing will ever be 100% right. And when we look at the story of the Exodus, we see their ingratitude. But we often don't see how we project the same type of attitude. That when we complain and we grumble, we're criticizing God and we're telling God, God, we don't like this life you've given us. We don't like this place we are in life. We, we don't like what's been served to us in this moment. In a way, we're really saying to God, God, I'm, I'm just too good for this. You, you must be mistaken. This must be for someone else because I'm, I'm better than what you've given. This isn't good enough, at least not for me. And every day we need to fight and we need to win the battle to be content. A second battle that the people in the desert fought, I think we fight as well, is the battle to stay focused. The battle to stay focused. Now, when God calls Moses to meet him at the top of Mount Sinai, he was gone for 40 days. But without the visible leadership of Moses, the people begin to lose their focus on God. And so I find it interesting that as much as they rebelled against Moses' leadership, as much as they complained about Moses' leadership, they missed him when he was gone. And the people basically became impatient with how long Moses was gone. You see, think about it this way. Moses was sort of their God connection. It was, Moses was the guy that heard from God and, and visited with God. And so Moses was, was the one who kind of connected them to God. And now he's been gone for, you know, almost 40 days, and they start missing their source of, of their God connection. And so what do they do? They collect up all of their jewelry, and they melt down the gold, and they mold it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they shouted, Oh, Israel, this is the God who brought you up out of Egypt. And they start giving credit to this calf. And they built an altar to worship this calf. And, and they celebrated by throwing this crazy, crazy party. But the problem with the golden calf, as with all of idolatry, is it's a misfocus. Where, where we choose to focus on on the material instead of the immaterial. We focus on what could be felt over what can be believed. We focus on the touchable rather than the untouchable. We focus on the tangible rather than the intangible. 
Now, what was so appealing about that calf? You know what it was? They could touch this God. They could see this God. They didn't need faith to know it was there. They could see it before them. And I think that's a struggle that we all have as we journey from where we began to where we want to end up. You know, God isn't visible. I can't see him. God doesn't speak in audible voices. I don't hear him. I can't touch him. And so we struggle with believing. And, and, and we often look for something else that could perhaps connect us to the spiritual. And so as we struggle through the journey from our baptism to the promised land, th there will be ample opportunities along the way to lose our focus on God. And instead, we, we, we set up these idols that, that are tangible and they're viewable and they're touchable. And we begin to focus on them. Oh, we're, we're too advanced and intellectual to create golden calves to worship. So instead, we take our focus off God and we set it on our career. Or, or perhaps a financial goal. Maybe a house or a car, a boat or an RV. And so these things begin to get our attention and our focus at the expense of God. They become what is so important to us because it is what we can see, it is what we can touch and know is real. But as we journey through this life, we have to be so careful that we don't let our focus on where God is taking us to, to be distracted by things that have little to no eternal value. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Galatians chapter 5 when he says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery. I imagine when Paul wrote these words to the Galatian church, he was thinking about Moses and the people who were wandering in the wilderness and how they had been truly set free by, by the blood of the Lamb and through the waters of the Red Sea but how they wrestled if they really wanted to stay free. And they continued to suggest it would be better to just go back to Egypt, where they once again would be tied up in slavery. But you know, you and I, we do the same thing in our journey from our baptism to heaven. There, there are Christians and there are times where even all of us, we're kind of wandering through the, this wilderness and we begin to wonder, man, would it, would it just have been well if we would have not made this decision to follow Jesus? I could have done my own thing. I could have done what I wanted to do. I could have been who I wanted to be. I remember those good old days, and it was so much better then. And, and Paul is imploring us, make sure that you stay free. Don't look back to where you came from. Don't chance it that you will once again get tied up in slavery. And so we have to battle to be content. We have to battle to stay focused. And the third thing that we see they battled and we have to battle is that is the battle to believe. The battle to believe. If you're familiar with the story of Exodus chapter 6, you know that soon after departing Mount Sinai, God directs the people to send 12 men to explore the land that God had promised to give them. So these 12 men went, and they were gone 40 days. It seems like anybody who goes anywhere in the Old Testament has gone 40 days. And so they return to the camp, and they report to Moses and Aaron and to the entire Israelite assembly, and they tell the man, this place is amazing. I mean, it is flowing like with milk and honey. And it's got these amazing fruits. It is a terrific place. And then comes, excuse me, then comes one word that changes everything. One word that delays what God wants to do for them for another 39 years. And that word is but. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. 
One of the 12, Caleb, argues we should go up and take possession of this land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread a bad report among the Israelites about the land they had explored. And not only the land they had explored, the land God promised to give them. And so for the next 39 years, this generation of Israelites wander in the desert as nomads, continuing to complain, continuing to grumble, even suggesting at times it would be better if they would just go back to slavery in Egypt. And while they had convinced themselves that God and Moses were somehow to blame for all of this misery, the fact is they had no one to blame but themselves. Not a single person over 20 years of age who departed Egypt actually entered the Promised Land 40 years later, except for Caleb and Joshua, the two spies who wanted to trust God and move forward. But again, this isn't all that much different than the way we walk in our Christian life. You know, God has made so many incredible promises to us that if we would just believe his promises and we would just take them at his word, and we would do what he tells us to do, I mean, we'd be abundantly blessed, just like he promised the Israelites. God says that we're to give the first 10% of our income to him and he will bless us beyond measure. So many of us have a difficult time trusting God enough to actually give the first 10%. God says to forgive and not let bitterness reign in our hearts, yet we have such a difficult time trusting God enough to let go of the hurt and the resentment in our life. God says that we're to care for the needy and the poor. Man, it is so hard to get involved in the lives of people who are needy and demanding and aren't like us. God says that we're to keep our minds pure and free from the unholy, yet we have such a difficult time changing the channel or exiting out of the web browser when something intriguing appears on the screen. See, God made a promise to these people that he would bless them by delivering this wonderful piece of real estate to them if they would move forward in faith and obedience and trust that he will fight their battles and he will cripple their enemies. But they battled to believe. And ultimately, they didn't believe. They didn't trust God. And they paid a dear price for their unbelief. A whole generation is lost in the wilderness because they never figured any of this out. This is why it's such a big deal to God. So here's what I really want you to see. What resulted from their discontentment what resulted from their loss? What of focus? What resulted from their unbelief? Here's where you write this down, put it in the app, remember this, postponed promises. Postponed promises. You see, bad attitudes can delay God's best for us. The Israelites grumbled and they lost their focus and they erected this idol and they failed to express a God-honoring faith in taking the promised land. And after this, it was another 39 years before they would ever again attempt to enter that land. And you know what? God never intended for this to be a long journey. He gave them a chance to enter the land right out of Egypt. But sin kept them in the desert. And they turned a one-month journey into 40 years of wandering. You talk about a postponed promise. They never got to the place of victorious living. They never got to the promised land. And my friends, the implications to this should not be missed on us. You know, many of us, we start the Christian journey well, but we fail to finish well. You see, all those who died in the wilderness, they had applied the blood of the Lamb. They had walked through the waters of the Red Sea. Yet they never made it to the destination. They never made it to the best that God had for them. They all died in the desert. And so let me ask your question as we finish this up. What promises of God have been postponed in your life because of your lack of contentment, your lack of focus, your lack of faith? What promises of God have been postponed in your life? See, when we choose 
to fight against the battle to be discontent and we choose to be content. When we fight the battle to lose our focus and we choose to stay focused on God and where he is taking us, when we choose to battle our unbelief and choose to believe and put our faith into action and do what God says to do when he says to do it, we are opening up the flow of God's promises and God's blessings and God's best in our lives. But we equally shut the flow off when we fail to do these things. And so I want to encourage you today, don't miss out on the best that God has for you because of bad attitudes. Just because you have applied the blood of the Lamb and just because you've walked through the waters of baptism doesn't mean you're enjoying God's best for your life. But that could change if you choose to change your attitudes. You know, on the great, sa- great seal of Australia, you will see an emu and a kangaroo. Now, why those animals? Well, neither an emu or a kangaroo can walk backwards. They can only move forward, which is the message that Australian leaders wanted to communicate when they designed the Great Seal of Australia with an emu and a kangaroo. Australia would be a country that only moved forward, never backwards. You see, the only direction that emus and kangaroos go is forward. It's the only direction they know. And you know what? That is God's plan for you, and that is God's plan for me in our lives. That we would move forward toward the promised land, satisfied with God and what he provides, focused on him and what lies ahead for us, and trusting and believing in him to do what he says to do. If we do those things, we'll receive the blessings of God. We fail to do those things, we'll experience postponed delayed and perhaps undelivered promises of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the challenge of today's word. God, to, to overcome the human tendencies to be discontent and to lose our focus and to not trust what we can't see. But I, I just pray, God, for today that you will that you will help us in this battle that each of us face and that we will uh, look to overcome. We will look to overcome our tendencies to be discontent, to lose our focus, to, to not believe, so that we will experience, Father, your best for our life. God, we love you and we thank you for bringing us together. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.